Welcome back to the Becoming Ageless podcast, where we have conversations about whole health for naturally increasing health span and decreasing biological age. I'm your host, Robin Lynn Fredericks, and I believe in living and being ageless. I recently met my next guest, Dr. Joseph Arnold, and I have been beyond inspired by his teachings, his wealth of knowledge, and especially the way he lives his life. He's the author of The American Diet Revolution, as well as four other books. He's a chiropractor, strength trainer, advisor, and an active senior games competitor, including winning gold in both discus and javelin. And he also coaches these two local high school um, track team. He sees patients six days a week, and he recently celebrated his 74th birthday. I just, I, I'm so inspired by, by this man. You're going to love him. But his clinic, Dr. Arnold's clinic, is called the Strength for Life Health and Fitness Center, and it's located in Western Massachusetts, and it's in its 39th year of operations. And there he focuses on fusing three natural disciplines of health, whole body exercise, nutritious eating, and comprehensive chiropractic health care. Dr. Arnold, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm so looking forward to digging into these disciplines, as well as your book, American Diet Revolution. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Robin. It is truly a pleasure to be here. Yay, I'm happy to hear that. And before we even get started, my audience knows I always ask this question, what are you doing in your own personal life to reach a state of health span? Because you are living it out, my friend, and I am, I am so loving this. So I, I'm anxious to hear this answer. Sure. Well, first of all, Robin, Seven, I consider 74 to be just the beginning. I, I agree. <laughs> so one of the, one of my personal mottos is that each day when I, or each year, when I celebrate a birthday, as I recently celebrated my 74th, I set a new goal and my goal is to be more fit, healthier, more energetic, and more active at 75 than I am at 74. So I don't compare myself to who I was when I was 26 or 36 or 46 or 54. I compare myself to who I would be in one year if I didn't try to take really good care of myself. So in other words, I believe that being ageless is looking forward, not behind. So I look forward to each year. I don't dread turning 75 next year. I look forward to it because. I have a goal to be healthier. I just totally have to do my best to meet that goal. I, I love that perspective. You know, I'm going to be 57 this year and, you know, I celebrate those trips around the sun. I have so much wisdom and experience behind me and, you know, I have a lot of fun and a lot of mistakes behind me and I'm thankful for those times. And I have no desire to go back and relive those times, but, you know, I don't look at, at aging the way that say my parents did. Whereas, you know, you wake up at 60 and you should expect aches and pains and, oh, well, that's just part of it. I, I love your perspective. I think that is absolutely fabulous. So kudos, my friend. And, um, I'm really, I'm really anxious to to really dig into this. So before we even get started, I read this little article right here about um, a former patient of yours, and maybe he's still with you, Ted Davidson, um, who had a horrible accident that you helped to kind of bring him back around to his, his whole health status. Um, can we just start this whole episode off with a wonderful testimonial and tell me what happened? Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, Ted, uh, about a little over three years ago, uh, Ted happened to walk by our clinic and just poked his head in because he was curious. Uh, at that time, he had been, well, let me, let me backtrack this. In, about 2015, Ted was a highly functioning executive and he would be hired by major corporations such as Target or 
uh, even before that, um, Montgomery Ward, he would, they would hire him to go to stores that were underperforming and they were actually losing money. Mm -hmm. And they paid him very handsomely to go to those stores, find out what was wrong and turn them around within a year or two. And he was extremely efficient at, at doing this and he was highly sought after. He actually, uh, moved to many different locations throughout the country, Dallas, Buffalo, um, New Jersey, wherever there was a problem, they would, they would hire Ted to do that. And, uh, it so happened that in 2015, he was hired to, um, turn around a, a store in Northwestern Massachusetts. And very soon after he was there, well, Ted's philosophy was the first thing I would do when I would go to a, an underperforming store was I would talk with every one of the employees, no matter how menial their job was and find out what they felt was wrong with the store. He said 90% of the time they could tell me what the problem was. And then I, all I had to do was change it. So there were. Right. So anyway, he was in 2015, he was, uh, turning around a store in Northwestern Massachusetts, and he was standing on a, a large gate. And for some reason, a large, a heavy piece of metal fell down off of that gate and hit him on the head. Oh. And when I mean heavy, it was probably 25, 30 pounds of um, metal. Mm. Um, this, the result of it was he had a severe brain injury and concussion and, um, he didn't really gain, uh, consciousness till about 30 days later when he was woke up in the hospital and, um, uh, basically he was non-functional. And so for the next, uh, two years, he went from doctor to doctor and they tried to do things to help him recover, but nothing worked. So eventually they told him, Ted, you're as good as you're going to be. You're totally disabled. You can't not work again. Um, so you're just going to have to live with your disability check and, and, uh, do the best you can. So he really became a hermit. Yeah. So for more than three years, he lived in a dark room in his house. He would really only come out. His wife is visually impaired. So he had to drive her to work, but his memory was so bad that he could not re remember how to get back home after he dropped her off at work. And this is a place where he had dropped her off many times. His daughters had to put post-it notes on the dashboard with pictures so that he could find his way home. Aww. So basically he was told that it was hopeless, but something in his spirit said, I'm not going to give up. Well, anyway, he dropped into our clinic and he talked to me. Um, he asked me if I could help him in the, during that three and a half years, he did what a lot of us would do if we were marooned in a dark room for that period of time, he ate. So his weight ballooned from the low two hundreds to the high three hundreds, nearly 400 pounds. Wow. Back when he came in, he couldn't even fit in the chairs I had to, to interview. So anyway, he asked me if I could help him. Well, in the back of my mind, I had just finished. In fact, uh, American Diet Revolution had just been published. And I said, in the back of my head, I said, no, I can help this guy lose weight because he told me what he was eating, which was, you know, the typical American sad diet. Right. Um, but he, what he really meant was, can you help me with my brain injury? And I avoided that subject. I did not give up on him, but I didn't want to promise him something that I couldn't deliver on. Of course. So, um, uh, I started him as I start many people and I have many disabled people who started my fitness center and it caught fire within a few weeks. He was coming six days a week and he was obviously it was very crude for him to begin because he was, um, uh, his waist was five feet around. Okay. He was enormous. <laughs> so we had to start very slowly, but 
for some reason, it, he just caught fire. And that inspired me to challenge him to do what I think is the most important part of strength exercise. And that is not just to do an exercise mechanically. You're not just lifting weights, but to focus in on your body and to feel what's happening in your body as you exercise. And some spark went off in his brain when he started to do that. And all, not only did he progress from being a klutz, and, and, you know, he would freely admit he was a total klutz. We had to help him on and off some of the machines and some of the apparatus, but he began to think differently. You could hear, he was very silent. He was uh, not, he was very soft-spoken when he came in, but all of a sudden he started to talk with more people and you could just see in the way that he was moving his body. It was like he was rediscovering himself. Yeah. Was actually, to make this story short, he was actually re-educating his brain through physical activities. He was discovering that link, which you know from, because you're an exerciser, Robert, you know that there's a link between your mental ability and your mental stability and your mental liveliness and the physical activities. He discovered that and he just took it to a, a level that I have never seen in any individual before. So within about four months, he had lost about 50 pounds. And within about a year, he'd lost over a hundred pounds and then wow. oh, it. Oh. And we had to close down because mm -hmm. the state regulations for a fitness center were that we couldn't be open. And I was really worried that during that time, he was going to go become reclusive and gain weight back. But no, he lost another 50 pounds while we were closed because <laughs> he was out exercising. He rediscovered his body. So in that summer, in the summer of 2021, I'm looking at him and I'm saying, this is a man who's starting to become agile. He was, he'd gone from 379 down to about 229. So I said, Ted, would you like to take on a challenge? There's something called the senior games, which are Olympic type events that are held in every state every year. And I think if you started to learn one or two of these events, it would take you even farther. Well, I, I thought he might hesitate, but no, he said, sure. <laughs> this is in fact, this is the guy who started working in his father's store at age six. He never done any athletics at all in his whole life. Oh my God. And I always wanted to do something like that. So I worked with him and lo and behold, within a short period of time, uh, he was doing so well that he I think it was in the Vermont games. He qualified to go to the national games, which are going to be in 10 days in oh Fort God. Lauderdale. Wow. And I are going together. We're going down to Fort Lauderdale. And, but the, so the funny thing is that he, his wife said, if you had told me a year ago that my husband was going to be in a track event and <laughs> in an Olympic event for seniors, I would have, I would have laughed hysterically. I could oh, never believe it. <laughs> yeah. And his daughters, two of his daughters live far away and they came back and they said, dad, if I had passed you on the street, I wouldn't have looked twice. I wouldn't have recognized you as the same person. Wow. And uh, so anyway, that is fabulous. But the point is now, just like I said, Robin, Okay, I said to him, you're 60 now. What's your goal? He said, at 61, I'm going to be healthier, more agile, and smarter than it was then. So, Way to go, Ted. Oh, I wish I could high five him right now. <laughs> so he is an inspiration to everybody that exercises here. He's so good. He actually went through and got his personal training certificate, and now he helps me in the fitness center. And he has a lot more credibility than me <laughs> from, because he's come from nowhere. Yeah. You know, he, he's an, everybody knows hey, if Ted can do it, I can do better. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's those, those kind of testimonies scream volumes. It doesn't matter that you've been in this for 40 years. I've been in this for 30 years. It's who's changing their life right here and now, you know, those people are like, it's, it's new news. <laughs> we, we right. hear what they're doing. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So I, uh, congratulations to Ted. Congratulations to you on that. Um, Dr. Arnold, how, what made you decide way back when to get into this arena of health? You know, Robin, it, it was with me when I was four or five years old. And I remember I was, we moved to a house and I was five years old and about five o'clock in the morning, I was out throwing a ball against the wall, making making noise and my mother got got up and said what are you doing and i said i'm learning to play baseball <laughs> and you know so it was never a question it was just a, a birthright or something very intuitive to me that that's what you do and to this day when i wake up each morning i can't wait to go out and exercise that's the first thing that I, I don't, being in bed is like a prison. Yeah. I'm looking for that opportunity to be physically active. And so it's, you use the, the right word uh, early when you did your introductions and then you said uh, fun. And that, that is, I think, the missing element for a lot of people. And that's why I always say exercise, if you internalize it, if you start, if you feel what's happening in your body, then it becomes fun. You don't question, oh, should I go and exercise today? Yes. I can't wait to exercise. I, I, now that's not the whole, it's not the panacea to all the world's problems, all our individual health needs, but it is a huge barrier for a lot of people. So yeah, people you know. like you and I have, our job is to inspire to be the inspiration for their perspiration. Absolutely. You know, I, I heard another podcast. Um, one of my, one of the people that I listen to is Dr. Andrew Hu Huberman. I'm sure you've heard of him. He's a neuroscientist. Yes. And I, I was just listening to this the other day. I was blown away by the study that was done where they took two mice and you know how mice naturally like to run on the little wheels. Actually, I think it was a mouse and a rat. Um, mice love to run on the wheels. And so they put the mouse in the cage, put a little wheel in there and the mouse would just jump on and run and run and run and run. But then they put a rat in there who doesn't like to run and they tied them together. So when the mouse jumped on and wanted to run, the rat had to run. And they said the biomarkers for the little mouse was amazing, it was off the charts. It was showing, you know, all these improvements from the running and the exercise, but the rat, who was miserable and stressed out by this whole entire thing, even though it was running, its biomarkers went backwards because it was so stressed out and he hated the process. <laughs> and, you know, how many times have we seen people who get into exercise, but they come in with an attitude, you know, they go into the gym or they start, you know, running or whatever, and they're just, I mean, I hate this. <laughs> and, you know, within a couple of days, a couple of weeks, they're injuring themselves. They're miserable. They're hating life. They're snapping at people because they're not happy. And I just thought that was remarkable. You know, such a phenomenal study to be done showing how, just like what you said, you have to enjoy it. Whatever it is you're doing, you have to enjoy it to get those benefits. I, I agree completely. I think that exercising, as is, of course, eating intelligently and uh, getting enough sleep and breathing properly, they're all learning processes. And if you love learning, if you like some subjects in school, exercise is just one of those learning processes. and. I'm sure you know that every day, if not every other day, 
you discover new things in your exercise routine. You refine it, you improve it. You discover new things about your body. Exercise is actually a dialogue, I think, between your brain and whatever organ systems of your body you're challenging in, in that particular exercise. And, and it, if, if that's laborious, if that's boring, then, then you're boring. <laughs> so we just, it's a discovering process and it's exciting. Each day is, is exciting and a little bit different and always challenging. Yeah. You know, as much as you're, we, we want to be ageless there, there are some inevitable things that happen to us, but those things are, uh, minor compared to the potential we have to discover new things about us. And that's, that's what's cool as we age, we can discover new things that we can do. We may not be able to bench press as much as we could when we were 25, but we might be able to, um, discover a new way to dance, or he might take up as Ted did the discus, or he's doing the javelin now. Oh, wow. The javelin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and then you, so the thing, the new things we learned that we can do far away the things that we used to do. And that's why I, it, you know, like Bob Dylan said, don't look back, look forward. So exactly, exactly. That is such a fabulous philosophy. Um, in your book, American Diet Revolution, and for those of you guys who are on video, you can see the book right here. Um, you talk about eating for well-being, economizing, ecologizing, exercising. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, why things, you talk about why things are failing and having to, you know, needing to stand up and create, you know, your own path and standing up for what's right for your health. And, and I'm a big advocate of that. I believe that we should all advocate for our own health. We should be our first advocate. We should ask questions. We should research. I don't eat a brand of food without looking into that, that farm. Um, why do you think that is so important? today. So let's, I guess let's start there. Why, why do we need to be doing this education? Why, why can't we trust what's on the label or what the advertisers are telling us or what big pharma tells us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first thing, the first thing, and, and the reason, the main reason I wrote the book is, um, first of all, let me just say that I started reading about nutrition when I was in high school in the 1960s and I followed and, and swallowed everything that I read. And some of the advice was, uh, pretty bad yeah, <laughs> to <there>. say the least. <laughs> and, um, but I, you know, I tried to do my best, learn and improve as in that in that day era, the, uh, a good nutritional shake was uh, milk with the uh, black snap molasses and wheat germ oil. Okay, uh -huh. that's the that's the type of information that uh, was available then. But um, as I progressed in my practice and became acutely aware that I had to do a better job of helping my patients control their body weight and control their health. Um, I found it necessary to, I, I tried to help people improve their diets, but I, I said, you know, I've got to do something more. So I started to read the best 21st century research that I could, um, books like grain brain or wheat belly or the big fat surprise. And there are, there are dozens of them. There are wonderful books and very well researched and, but they're not getting through. So what I tried to do in, um, uh, the American diet revolution is to, uh, distill my anger at the misinformation we'd been given in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And that was the, it reached its epitome in the food pyramid of 1992, which told us that we should eat seven to 11 servings of grains a day. And I've been keeping people's nutritional diaries for 35 years. 
And I can tell you that somebody, anybody who eats seven servings of grain a day, let alone 11, uh-huh. had nutritional problems, had weight problems, had diabetes problems, et cetera, et cetera. But then as I, as I read more, I, I understood how those, that information given to us was promulgated by economic and political uh, factions and not by nutritional research. And the reason is we never questioned. Now, I, certainly in 1992, when that food pyramid came out, I never said, I, I don't recall asking myself, well, why is the U.S. Department of Agriculture giving us this information? Why isn't it coming from some physiologists or why is it coming from an agricultural industry? And then when you discover, when you look at it, you see that's because those, that information was designed to sell food products, to support the big food industry. Yeah. <laughs> Generous mills. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like groats. And, and it was not based on human physiology. It was not based on studies of true nutrition and the nutritional studies that were brought forward were deliberately misconstrued. I mean, they were the, it's almost unfathomable how, um, vested interests were able to manipulate so-called quote research in the 20th century and convince people that that was what they should do. And, um, but it was only in the 21st century that this has really been exposed. So that's why I said, I'm not a nutritional researcher myself. I'm just a clinic, clinical practitioner, but I could see that if I, if my role, if I could just summarize the best of these 21st century researchers and make it a little easier for people to uh, improve their diets in, a, in an intelligent way that, that I could serve a purpose, uh, beyond what they're doing, because although most of those books are extremely well-written, they're not inspirational. As a matter of fact, what they did is they made me angry <laughs> and very angry. And that's why I, I called it American diet revolution, because we have to get angry about this. We were Dude, <laughs> we were, and we were the, well, just to give you a few statistics in 1961, the diabetes, diabetes rate in the United States was 1%. It's now about 12 to 13%. The obesity rate in the United States in 1961, which is when the, uh, American heart association, uh, American hospital association starting to recommend these, these, uh, diets throughout the 20 in the year 2000, the obesity rate in the United States had increased to 33%. It's now like 38%, 20% of our teenagers are now pre-diabetic. I mean, it's just rampant and it's all a result of people eating based on misinformation of the 20th century, which is seeped into the 21st century. And we have so many great scientists now, like your guests last week, who really have shown, we've got to change this. We have to reverse this. Even if we exercise every day, that's not enough. We have to learn to eat better. So that's the revolution that, that has to happen. I think that, you know, people like you have done a great job in inspiring more and more people to exercise later and later and more intelligently throughout their lives. But we need to also change that nutritional quotient because it's still not getting through. We it's do. still, it takes a revolution. We have a revolution in exercise. Women's sports, finally, you know. Or we're starting to see, you know, women athletes celebrated and throughout the world, which is, which should have happened 50 or hundred years ago, but we're not getting that 
equality in of information in our uh, nutritional efforts so far. So we have a big job ahead of us. We do. We do. I remember, you know, thinking back to the 90s, I was just really getting into nutrition. And I remember that food pyramid and looking at that food pyramid thinking, how in the world am I going to get people who are concerned about calories to eat that many servings of grain? And I mean, I would like sit down and try to do diet. How to get? How do I get that many grain servings? And I'm like, holy cow, plus everything else. And so I never, I never bought into that because I just, I, I was like, this is, this is just wrong. But you know, one that I bought into, Dr. Arnold, oh my gosh, back in, it was probably 94, 95 when they came out and said, oh, you should not have more than 30 grams of fat and even lower if you can do that. And I was like, I can do that. I could drop it down to 10 grams of fat. (laughs) <laughs> and I did that. And I thought, you know, I competed with myself and I'm like, I can do 10 grams of fat a day. And I did it for almost a year. And you know what happened? My fingers got all prickly from losing the fat. Kind of like, you know, when you're in a swimming pool for too long. Yeah. And I Not looked true. at that and I was like, what? What's going on here? And, you know, I, I kind of jumped off that bandwagon saying, okay, my body obviously needs some more fat here. And it was shortly after that, that people started coming back saying, ah, yeah, maybe we were wrong with that one. But yes, I, I completely hear you. I think as, you know, some of the nutrition professionals, as we were going through things, we, I know with myself, I always had to be the first guinea pig before I would put anything, put any client on something. I had to try it first to see what is, what is the good, the bad, the ugly with it. And, um, you know, it's kind of good because we've kind of been our own research subjects and we've learned how to navigate and what to look for. So now that you're in this place, You've been doing this for about 40 years and you have a brand new person sitting down in front of you saying, okay, I'm eager to go. I want to learn. How would you suggest to them to be able to do their own homework, to be able to educate themselves? Where would you tell them to start? Well, um, again, the first thing I I would uh, try to assess where that person is on the the continuum of health awareness. Um, Because you don't want to try to um, drown somebody in too much information or too much technical information. Um, So the first thing I, well, I always begin with, before I accept any patient into our, our training clinic, I always do a personal interview and assessment with them. And I, I have them write down, I I need to know what their health history is, whether they're taking any medications, whether they've had surgeries, what injuries they've had. And, um, but beyond that, I also ask them what their personal goals are. What is it that they, and when I begin to get an insight into what the person wants, then I can kind of begin to formulate a plan by which to help them educate themselves. It's not my job to just give my information. Like I'm the guru. I, I I want them because if you recommended something to somebody, you should eat this plan or follow this way. And they don't understand why they're not going to follow it for very long but they have to learn where they can um, begin and when, when, how they can start to think for themselves. So if I, I always do a one week nutritional diary of every person and I tell them, I, I'm not gonna give you the South Beach diet or the North Beach diet or the Indian Ocean diet or the Mediterranean okay. diet. I'm gonna find out the Judy diet uh-huh. and we're gonna see what can we do to make the Judy diet better. Right. And so that they don't have to make it, but then, 
see that makes them have to be an active participant in changing their own diet rather than just accepting what I say. I don't want them to do what I say. I want them to do what they think is right. And so one of the things I learned from their diary is what they're doing. And if, for instance, I find somebody that's very frustrated because she's been gaining weight and not eating any fat, I say, you know, there's a book by Nina Teicholz called The Big Fat Surprise. I think you should begin by reading that book because that'll, that'll help you understand you don't have to be afraid of healthful fats. Right. But somebody else who, um, let's say, eats uh, oatmeal, the, the biggest, the most common breakfast of people who have trouble losing weight is oatmeal, toast, oatmeal with raisins or bananas, toast, a glass of orange juice, and coffee. And insulin spike goes. <laughs> That's right. You know, and that. Yeah. And they say, well, I eat really healthy. I can't understand. I, can't, I eat really healthy breakfast and, and I can't understand. So with that person, I say, okay. Let's, let's have, I think the first book you ought to consider reading is wheat belly and, and understand about wheat, but that might be, if I've got a heart patient, um, there's a, uh, I can't think of her name right now. She's a British children's neurologist and her, her book is called put your heart where your mouth is. Okay. <laughs> And it's just about how she works with, actually with people with schizophrenia and autism and improving their diet. And so for somebody that has an autistic child, that might be a, the appropriate place to begin. Right. I don't tell them to begin with my book. Uh, yeah. they, they can, but <laughs> I want them, you know, we, everybody has to start in a different place. Right. Just like in exercise, I need to. I always do a body comp test to find out, you know, if somebody's 49.5% body fat and that happens, I'm not going to start them out on a vigorous cardio program to have them lose 50 pounds in a, in a month. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I got to just get them step by step and bring them along. Well, the same thing with nutrition. You, you just evaluate where each person is and then you do your best to try to inspire them, give them information. And if they go, th I think Robin, that if we go through the discovery process, we discover things just like that, like you were talking about how your fingers felt numb. You <laughs> discovered that you felt that you perceived that when you feel things happening in your body, you realize, oh, gee, I, I might have to make a change here. And then. But when you do that rationally, then it becomes your idea, not something that Robin told me, or uh, well, in your case, you told yourself, but <laughs> not something that somebody else told you. Right. Absolutely. That, there's a lot of joy in discovering things for ourselves. So that's why I go back to learning. And in American Diet Revolution, the first armament that I told people that I, at, I try to encourage people is to educate ourselves, to read. But again, where they read or what book they read depends on each individual. Where they are, yeah. yeah. Well, you're second. Why don't we start by trying to, you know, do a scientific analysis of the microbiome? <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, that's down the line. It is down the line for sure. Uh, so your second armament is eating for well-being. And I know this is, you know, dependent on each person and well, where they are. But for the general public, the people who are listening, do you have a couple of steps that everybody should be kind of paying attention to? Well, yeah, I, I, I think first of all, having a goal, uh, eating for well-being is not just that you're trying to lose weight, but you, you're trying to, um, do become a responsible citizen of planet earth. And that means respecting 
the uh, environment in which we live and trying to eat foods which were grown in a healthy environment and didn't cause us to, uh, you know, um, that are, that are grown without pesticides and things that right. not only contaminate us if we eat them, but contaminate the air uh, around us at the same time. And water. Yeah. Yeah. So again, just developing the, the, the desire to, uh, improve our health rather than just to lose weight or just to throw a javelin farther or just to have a better tennis serve. It's just to create that personal experience where you feel like you're getting closer to the natural world, I guess you would say. Right. You use the term vegetarian, which I love that. I always say, you know, I'm plant focused, but I love the term vegetable tarian. Um, how many, we, we, we all need to focus really on these plant foods, especially vegetables. How many servings should a person really aim for a day? Do you think <laughs> that's a that's great, in an optimal diet? Yeah. Well, I think somewhere to just to answer your question, generally somewhere between five and 10 a day, uh -huh. um, you know, for, for some. So again, you kind of have to start at the beginning. I've, you know, I've, when I do a diary, I've had some people that only had two vegetables in a week. Yeah. So I'm not going to say, well, you need 10 a day. Right. I'm going to try to say, you know what, if we can get two vegetables into your diet a day to start, but at, get them at least to the point of eventually getting up to five, Yeah. you know, as you're aware of the, the, uh, well, one of the most important things about vegetables is, and, and about nutrition in general is that we're not just denying ourselves, oh, geez, I can't eat bagels anymore. I can't, can't eat this, but just as important as eliminating some things in your diet, it's important to add new things that replace them. So instead of munching on potato chips, you start to munch on pistachios right. or, or, or stuff that you develop these, uh, better avenues so that you don't feel like you're being denied. You're as you will attest, if you eat healthfully, it feels good. It tastes good. Pistachios taste great. I, you know, once you develop a, a acquire and develop a taste for things like that, the old things that maybe you like in your teens don't appeal to you oh, as yeah. much. Yeah. So replacing those uh, foods is just as important. It's, not, it's just as important to add new good foods, to add sauerkraut to your diet as it is to eliminate bagels. Right. <laughs> Definitely. Absolutely. I, I don't know about you. I love getting like the, the big containers of lettuce. And sometimes I'll sit, if I'm going to like do some watching TV or something, <laughs> other people around me grab potato chips. I grab my little thing of lettuce and I just sit there and munch on lettuce and it's crunchy. If you want to throw a little salt on it, fine, go ahead, do so. But it's like, I, I enjoy, I actually enjoy it. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm punishing myself. I enjoy that. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it get back to the term vegetable terry and the reason yeah. I use that word is I wanted to, um, make that book and my recommendations to be non-political, not to get into the argument of should you eat meat or should you have any animal products, but to design diets, which everyone can separate, you know, right. everyone's a you can be a vegan veg vegetable terrian, you can be a lacto ovo vegetable terrian, or you can be an omnivorous vegetable terrian. But yep. the common denominator is we all need to eat a lot of vegetables. Yep. Vegetables are the staff of life, not, yep. not bread. Vegetables are the staff of life. And if, if we all ate more vegetables, there'd be a demand for more organic vegetables and there would be more 
vegetable farms and then be fewer big grain farms throughout the country. So it's, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. I agree with that. I totally, you know, I, I'm a big believer in that we should be listening to our bodies and working with our bodies. And um, I always use the term that I'm a Robin Tarian and you would be a Joseph Tarian. <laughs> Okay. And, you know, that, you know, I believe in being plant focused, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to figure out how to put this veg. I'm a Robin Tarian veg- vegetable Tarian. <laughs> if that's any time spots. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, those, those are great, great points. And, you know, whether a person is choosing to eat meat or not eat meat or, you know, like us, we, we listen to what our body is saying and, one day we might be plant based entirely, and the next day we might have some fish. The next day we might have a hamburger. You know, it's a matter of making those healthy choices and getting those vegetables in and giving ourselves the diversity of food that's out there. Um, what are some, if, if you will, if you'll indulge me, what do you eat in a day? Um, well, the first thing is I do not eat in the morning. I exercise first. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you talked in your last interview about fasting, intermittent fasting. What I find works well for me, and it doesn't work for everybody, but I like to exercise on an empty stomach. Uh, so I have not eaten until, you know, the evening meal the night before. Mm-hmm. say seven or eight o'clock and then I won't eat again probably till at least 10 or 11 o'clock so just without even trying I've gone 14 15 hours um now six days a week I'm in, in the clinic in in the morning so I don't want to handle food too much so I the night before I make a nutritional smoothie and it, it usually has uh, some type of uh, powder protein, whey protein, or hemp protein, or some mixture of that. And then I always have flaxseed with it. And then I throw in uh, some vegetables, usually any leftover vegetables from the night before that got cooked but didn't get eaten. I just throw those in and usually maybe some blueberries or something like that. I also, uh, often I, I drink, uh, I, or I eat goat yogurt or goat kefir. <laughs> so I usually put a little of that in and then I'd kind of top it off with some almond pro- protein milk. So that, and that usually makes about, uh, a quart and a half and I don't eat the whole thing. Yeah. For breakfast. I usually eat half of it. In fact, I divide it up and I'll eat it one day and then the other half the next day. So that's my breakfast. Okay. And lunch, I, um, and I don't, the reason I have that for breakfast is I don't want to handle food, that, you know, cause I, I wash my hands all day long, but yeah. you just don't feel like putting your hands on people if you had your hands on food. So <laughs> I can just sip that. And it, it yeah. usually takes me two or three hours to, finish it. Yeah. Uh, at, at lunch, I usually, um, either bring what I call salad in a jar. I just take a large Mason jar and I make a salad the night before that's all made the night before. Uh, it usually has some, uh, protein in it, like some, uh, so, uh, hard or soft boiled eggs and usually lots of nuts, almonds, walnuts, Brazil nuts. Uh, I, I just like nuts. In fact, Nuts are kind of my snack food throughout the day. If I'm I'm hungry, I just, I have, I just bring jars of nuts and I keep them in the refrigerator and I just munch if I need them. If I don't, I don't. And then, uh, the other thing I, I, sometimes I nibble on a little, uh, goat yogurt or goat kefir during the afternoon. If I'm hungry, if I'm not, I don't. And then in the evening, we usually have some, um, fish or turkey or, um, and then lots of vegetables with, with it. I always cook like three or four vegetables. My wife complains that I make 
too many dishes because they cook, you know, like four or five different vegetables in it. But, but that's okay because whatever is left over, I just throw it in the blender for to make the smoothies right. for the next day. So that's that's pretty much it. Um, it doesn't vary, except the vegetables vary quite a bit. It, you know, whatever I just buy, whatever vegetables look, you know, organic and look fresh and healthy. Yeah. I just go for those. And a lot of times it's something I haven't had before. And, uh, so, but that's, that's the way how we learn. So yeah. no, that's great. So have you, um, I, I'm sure when, when you're dealing with people as, as they're aging, as they're getting older, um, and, you know, there's a lot of study, a lot of research out there about how people over 60 need a little bit more protein in their diet than perhaps somebody in their 30s, 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s. How do you help somebody figure out how much protein that they should be getting or what, what advice do you have for them to, to get that in? Yeah, well, uh, you're right. That, that's a very good point. And, and well, what I try to do is, again, um, just suggest ways that we can add a little protein to their diet. Now, I just forgot to mention one thing that, uh, uh, I, I drink during the day and that's bone broth. Mm. Uh, I usually have that as a, like a cup of tea. <laughs> nice. And, uh, but I think bone broth is extremely important, especially for women, especially women you know, 60, 70, 80, our average age trainee here, by the way, 68. So mm -hmm. I've started people. In fact, I started the guy this week who was 86. I've started oh, people oh. as old as 91. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, but I think bone broth is not just because of its protein content, because a cup of bone broth, and, and if any of your re readers are not really aware of bone broth, it's, it's bones and cartilage and from chickens or beef or, uh, lambs or whatever that's been cooked for at least 48 hours and sometimes longer. Um, so that all of the, but what is just as important as the protein is, are, are all the minerals because a lot of things that we pay a lot of money for glucosamine sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, methyl sulfonyl methane, those are constituents of hyaline cartilage, which are part of the bone matrix that dissolves when you make bone broth. So if, if you're really industrious, you, you, you make your own or, but if you're don't have quite the time to do it, and I usually don't, you can buy it in brick packs, uh, yeah. of course, or you can, uh, a lot of, um, organic and, uh, pasture raised butchers now in our area make bone broth just to, and, and they sell it in core plot. So they're very easy to, it's very easy to use, but that's the great adjunct to somebody who's not getting enough protein in their diet. Yeah. And plus it has virtually all the minerals we need, not all the vitamins, but then again, we're eating five to 10 vegetables a day. So that's going to be, uh, old go a long way towards supplying a lot of those, uh, vitamins. Right. Plus bone broth has a beautiful source of collagen in it, which as we age, we definitely want that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why your complexion is so nice. <laughs> Love my collagen. Um, so we know, okay. So we know about eating for well being and educating ourselves. Um, you, you talk about in the book also economizing, um, how do we, how do we do that? I mean, everything is so expensive. You talk to people about buying organic, buying natural. Everybody's like, ugh, it's like so much more expensive. I'd rather just go grab something off the shelf. That's not even produce. It's in a package because it's cheaper. How, right. what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with this? Well, the first thing I say is organic food, organically raised foods are a lot cheaper than the drugs you're going to have to take if you don't eat them. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, you have to eat, you know, if, if somebody, somebody is obese and somebody is diabetic, the, and, and they start taking 
medications in their 20s, which a lot of people do now, they are cash cows for the big pharma for 40, 50 years. And what you spend on those medications for diseases that you could have prevented will many times over exceed what the cost of those uh, vegetables would uh, or other um, organically raised uh, foods would cost. So it's like anything else. It's like if you buy a car, you buy a, a cheap rundown car, the price might be right to start. But if you calculate all the other uh, costs of it, pollution, breakdowns, all the other things, they're going to cost far more. So the other thing is that when you invest in high quality foods, you're going to find, at least in my opinion, that you don't eat as much of them, even though they may cost more per pound, you're not going to eat as much. Uh, you know, it may look like pistachios are, you know, $24 a pound and what I could get a pound of potato chips for the same, you know, $3 or $4, okay. but you're not going to eat a pound of pistachios at one sitting because they are fulfilling the nutrients. Yeah. We're going to tell your brain, oh yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied. But if you eat the potato chips, you could eat two pounds or three pounds of, and go on and on. So Wait. a lot of, you know, it's, it's just like anything else. It's qualitative versus quantitative. Yeah. And if we come out, if we eat quality foods, we're, we're going to eat less of them. And, and I think that most people recognize that if you start to eat more healthfully, the quantity of the food you eat is less. The, the, the nutritional density is much greater. You're satisfied more easily and you don't eat as, as much of it. So it's just, a, you know, that, that type of, of trade-off, but I think the other thing is, especially with parents is parents tend to be really protective of their children. And if they recognize that they can help prevent some diseases in their children, if they, um, give them good nutrition, they're willing to make those sacrifices for high quality food, even if they have to pay a little bit more for it. So, um, you know, I, we're always faced with those dilemmas that, you know, quantity versus quality, but, uh, I think in food. The more we educate ourselves, the, the more easier that decision is, is made. Very true. Very true. So is there, you know, as we're, we're closing things up, as we're ending things a little bit, is there any last minute advice that you would give to somebody who is in their midlife, they're, they're approaching, you know, those, the latter parts of life maybe, and they're wanting to get healthy. Do you have any advice, just general advice to give them? Well, yeah. The first thing I would ha have them do is to, if, if, if they're not really happy with their own uh, personal health at this time, is to get in touch, ask around to, to other people that they, they may see, and, and find out if there's somebody who... Uh, can advise them a, a health advisor. It might be a doctor, although I wouldn't say it's uh, always the case. It, but just to try to find somebody who can give them a little bit of advice about how to improve their uh, their life. We all learn from each other. Maybe it's an uncle. They've got an uncle who's a really healthy and exercising. What do you do, Uncle John, to be, what, what inspires you? Where did you learn this? And, you know, we, we all learn from each other, not to feel as though we can solve every problem ourselves. We have to be open, just like you have a podcast, which is based on learning. Learning is the kernel of uh, inspiration that we can all take part of. And if, if we're open to learning, 
we can learn new things about our bodies, about our health, about the peace in the world, um, all those things. If we close our minds, our bodies are going to close down too. So that's what I would say. Just we have to keep ourselves open to learning. And you know that the people that you really admire who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, they're reading the New York Times every cover to cover, or they're doing a crossword. They are physically and mentally a lot active and they're not retiring. You know, when, when I was a kid, a retirement home was known as a rest home. And when you turn 65, I guess you were just supposed to go there and sit. And in, in 1930, when social security started in the thirties, the average lifespan was about 66. So they only expected somebody to go on social security for about 18 months. And then they wouldn't have to pay out anymore. Well, uh, <laughs> times have changed. The problem. <laughs> that's the problem, but that's a good problem. Yeah. We, we have to take advantage of it. It's not just, as you would say, it's not just adding years to our life. It's adding life to our years. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know that we are, we're living older today, but we're not living healthier as a general society. And yeah. That puts a great burden on our healthcare system. So I'm with you. It's it's time that we we figure out our health. We make it a priority, and you know we start gaining our health back. We start taking it back, and it's not really about what's convenience. It's about what's going to keep me out of a wheelchair so I can go out and play tennis, you know, up until the end, you know, right. one, some, some research, and I don't remember who to be able to give him credit, but I definitely love the phrase that I want to die young, but very old, that, you know, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I expect to be out there hiking and laughing and enjoying life to whatever degree it is going to be up until the very end. And I think we have more choices to be able to get us there today. And you're a big part of that. Well, a little part. Oh, you're a big part of it. You are helping a lot of people. And I really appreciate that. And you guys, you need to buy this book on Amazon. Can you see that? It is um, American Revolution or American Diet Revolution, excuse me, by Dr. Joseph Arnold. And he has several other books out there as well. Now, if people want to find you, um, they want to connect with you, how's the best way for them to do that? I would say the, the easiest thing would be um, on our website, which is strengthforlife.com. That's been my trademark for for 25 years. Um, but you can contact me by, uh, at Dr. Joseph, D-R-J-O-S-E-F at strengthforlife.com. Wonderful. And of course we'll but have that link on our show. Strengthforlife.com is with, yeah. Okay. And you're on Instagram too, correct? Dr. Arnold, are you still with me? Uh, there you are. <laughs> a little frozen there. So you are, are you're on Instagram also, right? Yes. And what is your. But your I don't know group? what the handle is. So <laughs> okay. I'll put it, I'll put it on the show notes and it'll also be with the show poster. Um, you guys, if you have any questions about this show uh, for Dr. Arnold or for myself, head over to our Instagram page at Becoming Ageless Podcast and drop your questions under this show's poster. And of course, our website is becomingagelesspodcast.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to stay in the know. And if you enjoyed today's show, I would so appreciate you rating the show, subscribing to the show and sharing the show with your friends. And of course, as I mentioned, you can find all of the links listed in the show notes. And if you want to catch up with me, you can find me all over social media at Robin Lynn, R-O-B-Y-N-N-L-I-N. You guys, thank you so much for being with us today. And Dr. Arnold, thank you for being with me today and for sharing all of your wisdom. Good luck to you and um, good luck to Ted 
and the upcoming games. I, I hope that you'll kind of touch base with us and let us know how Ted did. Are you playing this time? Are you competing? Oh, yes. Yeah, just in the discus. Yes. Okay. Please keep us posted and um, send us a picture, too. I would love to get that up on our, our um, Instagram page. Uh, uh, uh. And you guys, again, thank you for joining us today. And I hope you'll join us next time here on Becoming Ageless as we uncover new tips, tricks, actions, and science to increase your whole health, health span. Stay ageless, y'all.